by the neck until you are dead, dead, dead. My grandfather once took me fishing. I was seven. I suppose he must have gone fishing frequently, although I never recall him bringing back any fish, nor indeed any other fishing trips. He woke me up at five before the sun was up. It was late summer. A cold, hard rain had been slashing down for the previous week. It was not raining that morning, although it was very, very cold. Together we walked in the darkness down to the seafront. I carried one set of rods in a brown canvas case. He carried the other, together with a mass of squirming maggots, floats, weights, sandwiches, and a thermos of homemade soup, all in a small wicker basket. He also carried a folding stool. We walked down to the beach until we reached the sea. My face and hands were chilled but I'd been bundled up warmly by my grandmother before I left the house. We set up the rods, baiting our hooks with maggots, casting off and waiting in the night. I listened to the waves pound on the pebbles. After a while, the sky began to gray and I realized I had had enough of fishing. The beach was empty. My arms were tired and this had gone on too long. We'd caught nothing and I was wondering why the fish were ignoring our bait, the thick, sandy maggots that my grandfather had impaled with such care. Wasn't it just what they wanted? My grandfather sat on his cloth stool, patient and waiting. I reeled in my line and left the fishing rod on the pebbles. Don't go too far. At that time in the morning, the beach was empty. There were no other fishermen, no early morning walkers. The pre-dawn world lacked color. There was gray in abundance and a strange, strained blue. There was one patch of color on the beach and I walked towards it. I walked around the back and looked inside. It was empty.
I am lonely now and very far from home. I find myself grasping for my roots awkwardly, and I wonder what my grandparents would think of me were they to meet me today. Ask their shades about me, and I imagine they would pull fumbling ghost photographs from their wallets and handbags, show you a small, solemn child with huge hazel eyes. I'm afraid he's a bit of a handful, they'd say. For my grandparents, I will always be a small boy. I also have my mental snapshots of them, frozen moments of the past, in which the dead are captured in tiny loops of motion. I play them now in my mind. 1972, my father's father, on day release from the madhouse on the seafront at South Sea, coughing thick gray phlegm into a paper handkerchief, his voice a low and bitter growl. 1986, my father's mother, the only person to whom I have ever said goodbye properly before they died. I remember her holding a paring knife and peeling apples before she sliced and ate them, her hands red and wet and arthritic, the apple peel curling onto newspaper in her lap. Also, I remember the tart taste of the apples. The path of memory is neither straight nor safe, and we travel down it at our own risk. It is easier to take short journeys into the past. Remembering in miniature, constructing tiny puppet plays in our heads. That's the way to do it. That's the way to do it. My great uncle Morton was always my favorite adult relative, not because he was any more or less pleasant to me than any other, but because Morton was the first adult I was able to look in the eye. Another vivid memory, six years old, a performance of a children's play on the seafront. It was a burning summer's day. The performance spoiled me for any other because the actors performed in full body costumes, accurate in every detail, lions, rats, dance, jokes. After the performance was over, I passed backstage and saw the animals unfastening their heads, removing their skins. Later, it occurred to me that I should have put the lion's head on. Then I would have become the lion, a stumbling thing with a huge head, uttering vast truths I dared not think as a child. I lived in a land of giants in those days. All children do. In a perfect world, it occurs to me now, I would write this in blood, not ink. One cannot lie if one writes in blood. There is too much responsibility, and the ghosts of those one has killed will rise up and twist the pen down true lines, change the written word to the unwritten as the red lines fade on the page to brown. That's why deals with the devil must be signed in blood. If you sign your name in blood, it's your real name. 
You can't change it. There now. And already I'm speaking of blood, and it's the past I meant to speak of. My mother was very pregnant, and I had been sent away for three weeks to stay with my father's parents. That was a year later, of course, when I was eight, shortly before my grandfather went mad. He had a huge black Daimler, which he eventually crashed into a wall. He walked away physically unharmed, but he was never the same. All his affairs, business and otherwise, were over, and he stayed at home all day, shouting at my grandmother, spitting saliva in his fury of words. When she could take no more, he was taken away before worse could happen. Punch, of course, killed Judy. That was something I had forgotten until two years ago. I had heard that they had sweetened the show in recent years, extracted all murder and hurt and revenge from it. But no, after Punch had killed the baby, Judy returned and asked him where it was. then that death only occurs so frequently in puppet shows to permit the showman to withdraw his left hand and introduce a new character. My grandfather had a small amusement arcade on the seafront. No, I'm being imprecise. It wasn't on the seafront. It was just far enough away from the seafront to be a complete commercial failure. My grandfather had bought it cheaply and turned it into an inferior copy of the local theater. It was a half-empty maze of old slot machines, of shops and booths. It was a mermaid. If I close my eyes and remember, I can still hear the mermaid singing. She only had one song. People would stare at her. I wonder if one day that you say that you care madly. You can't stop things from changing. That's my grandfather talking in my head, his voice cigarette roughened, street smart with the pride of a man who has dragged himself up from street level and now drives a Daimler.
Um, we can either do, if you feel like getting involved, we can talk about what we've done so far, or would you like us to show you a couple of other little things that we have that are sort of out of sequence? Yeah? yeah. Okay. Um, <coughs> do you want to start with, let's start with a more big no. Oh, that's okay. Oh. For so the, if we get to that. Speed by speed. I didn't issue with doing other stuff like that. Yeah. Because I can go grab it while you You want me to throw you in the box? I'd also threaten creatures. I could throw you in the rubbish. Right? 